God gave us this song during our 40 days of prayer. And we want to give it to you this morning. So right where you are, whether you know it or not, lift your hands as we receive God's spirit today. Real simple song. Go like this. If your people who are called by your name would gather themselves and pray, then you'd send the rain, the rain of revival, and power would spring forth again. Send the rain. Oh, we need your anointing today. Send the rain. Let your spirit fall. Send the rain. If your people, if your people who are called by, who are called by your name, gather themselves, gather themselves and pray. Lord, please send Lord, the please rain. Send the
Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear them and be glad. Will you magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. You are never, ever, I will never ask you to clap for me, but I will ask you to give God praise, because he is worthy of all of our praise. It is a joy and a privilege to see in the flesh, <laughs> so many of you have had the opportunity to see you either riding in a car or on a Zoom or some other type of call, but it's just a wonderful thing to be able to lay eyes on you. And uh, I'm excited about this next leg of our journey. We've already started together, but I'm excited about the privilege to run this journey with you. I want to say how much I appreciate my little brother, Pastor BC, you all call him Mundabusi and Wadi. We just celebrate him. You do know that that song that, he just, that you just heard, the Lord gave that to him during those 40 days of prayer. That is an original song written by our associate pastor. He is so gifted. He is just a joy to work with. And I thank God for his providential leading that put me in a situation with pastor that I have chemistry with. I genuinely enjoy working with Pastor Wadi. Before I begin today, though, we've got to give God praise for many reasons, but one of the things I want to highlight and just ask you to praise God with me for is that when we, when I got here, PJELC, the Precious Jewels Early Learning Center, was in debt. And it was in debt to the tune of $90,000. And I want to let you know that we received a letter from the conference this week indicating that we have a zero balance and that that debt is paid in full. Now, I appreciate that polite praise, but I, I, think, I think you ought to give God a little bit more praise than that because in less than a year, $90,000 worth of debt has been liquidated. To God be the glory, and we praise God for the leadership of Dr. Dean and the entire PJELC board. We, we want to encourage you to be our uh, greatest marketers for both CAA and for Precious Jewels Early Learning Center. Well, it's time for the word, and so if you will, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, uh, that's a book that is... I imagine familiar to many of you, Daniel chapter 4. And I'll read in your hearing verses 1, 2, and 3. Just three verses set the stage for our sermonic consideration this morning. Verse 1, verse 1 of Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. Verse 2, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation 
to generation. Verse 2 of the New Living Translation says it this way. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. In fact, I'm so excited to have some people in the building that I'm going to ask you to repeat these words after me. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. You ought to touch yourself and say, God has done it for me. We've gathered in this sanctuary again for the first time in more than 15 months, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me on the message I've simply entitled, I've Got a Testimony. I've Got a Testimony. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, and now we ask that you would speak through me that we might hear a word from the Lord. Your word has power in it. Uh, you spoke, it was done. You commanded, it stood fast. And so we believe that if you speak in this place, you can create in us new hearts, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit. You spoke outside a limestone sepulcher. And Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, when you spoke, you called him by name, by your words, that have living and creative power in it. He came forth from that dusty tomb to live again. And we believe if you speak, you can create on us new hearts. You can raise us who are dead in trespasses and sins. So speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on thee. Each heart hushed to listen with expectancy. Speak, Lord, in this sacred hour. Let us hear thy voice. Let us feel thy touch of power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got a testimony. Uh, I'm not going to make you do this all through the service, but it's been 15 months. I, I just need you to turn to your neighbor across the, the barrier and just say, I've got a testimony. And if you don't have a testimony, then I pray that before you leave here today, you will have a testimony. I've got a testimony. This is Gloria from Allegheny East Conference sitting in the front uh, of camp meeting with her. Her lawn chair is here today. God bless you. Good to see you. God has been good. Uh, amen. Thank you, Sister Churchill. God has been good. You're here. And to those of you who are still watching online, you're still here. Maybe not physically, but you're still on the planet. You're still here. Y you didn't have to be here, but after 15 months, God has been good and you're still here. This pandemic touched all around the planet and just in America alone, over 600,000 Americans are dead. I was listening the other day. The pandemic has actually lowered the life expectancy for the first time in decades. And the life expectancy of black males has gone under 70 years. But you're still here. God has kept many of you from contracting the virus. And others of you who have contracted it have recovered. God has been good. This thing has touched almost everybody in some way, but God is good. The fact that you can hear me today, that you can see me today, that you can feel your fingers and you can inhale and exhale is reason enough for you to say, I've got a testimony, God has been good. So much has changed over the last 15 months. You'll remember near the very beginning, uh, unemployment skyrocketed for the first time in a long time. Uh, and yet, despite the fact that some lost jobs and some people, their hours got reduced, I'm a living witness that I have been on a recipient of the COVID-15. Uh, that's, a, that's a little joke among people about a little extra weight around the waistline that comes from sitting behind screens and not moving enough. God has been good. What I'm saying is he still put food on your table. He put a roof over your head. He put clothes on your back. Even through this difficult time, God has been good. And I've got a testimony. Today, though, I want to take you uh, to a testimony found in Daniel chapter 4. Today's testimony service is led off by the most unlikely of candidates, if you please. It's not one of the three Hebrew boys that we met in chapter 3 of Daniel. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those boys who were thrown into the fiery furnace for refusing to compromise their faith. 
for standing for God and, and remaining allegiant to the true and living God. Those three Hebrew boys, they're not coming to the mic today to testify, even though they could, because they could testify that when they were thrown into the furnace of affliction, the only thing that burned was the ropes that were holding them. And the best part is that these three were joined in the fire by a fourth that was recognizable to an unbeliever as having an uncanny likeness to the Son of God. God has been good. And they could testify, but not today. Not today. They're not coming to the mic. And, and you know who else is not coming to the mic? Not the one spoken of in Daniel chapter 1 and 2. The young man who had been endowed with uncommon wisdom had a wisdom that was able to confound all of the wise men of Babylon. I'm talking about Daniel, who's been renamed Belteshazzar. No, he's not coming to the mic to share his testimony today. Today's testimony is being brought by a heathen king. Ah, you, you, let, me, let me do it again. He's not being brought by one of the captives of Judah, not one of the finest of, of, of Judah, but it's being brought by a heathen king, one who worshipped the false god Marduk, whose food and wine was offensive to Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. But Nebuchadnezzar is coming to the mic today. Nebuchadnezzar is not the same man that we first met in chapter 1 and chapter 2. He's a changed man. It's the same man in the same body, same name, but, but he's a different man because of something that God has done for him. And in this chapter, he starts off in an autobiographical way to say, let me tell my own story. Let me testify of how good the true and living God has been to me. He's not a Jew. He captured the Jews, but he's not a Jew. He's a Babylonian. He's, he's Chaldean. And, and he echoes the sentiments of believers. Psalm 66 and verse 16, come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. Psalm 107, you know that one. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is, come on, finish it, good, and his mercy endureth for how long? This heathen king is unashamedly and unabashedly giving glory to the God of the universe. King Nebuchadnezzar has a unique testimony because of what he's been through and what God has taken him through. And I want to say from the outset to those of you who always sit in on your testimony that your testimony is your story of your encounter with God and what he has done in your life. Your story is unique. Your story is not my story and my story is not your story. No one else can tell your story quite the way you can. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons, and I need you to get this as we start off this brief message today, that God will use your story to inspire someone else who's going through something similar. Paul says that we can comfort others with the comfort that we have received. What God has done for you will be an inspiration to someone else, so don't be afraid to open your mouth and to say, God has been good, and I've got a testimony. Even if you've been through a mess, God can turn that mess into a message. Come on, say amen, somebody. Without a test, there can be no testimony. So perhaps Nebuchadnezzar, this heathen king, can inspire us to tell others what God has done for us. It's testimony time. The mic is open. Who will be first? And Nebuchadnezzar stands up and comes to the mic, if you please. First, giving honor to God, who is the head of my life. You can't tell it. Let me tell it what the Lord has done for me. He's, he's testifying. If you don't pay attention, most of Daniel is written by Daniel, but Nebuchadnezzar says, I want to write my own story. And so in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. Nebuchadnezzar is testifying, y'all. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. I was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. Nebuchadnezzar says, I was sitting in the shade sipping organic lemonade. I, I had it good, y'all, but let me tell you, Nebuchadnezzar says, how good God is. One night I'm laying on my bed, stretched out on my sateen Egyptian cotton sheets, and in the middle of the night, I have a nightmare. I do what I always do because I'm the king. I'm the king of the head of gold, chapter two. I, I'm the king of 
all the other kingdoms. Everybody else comes when I call them. And so I command, I demand, people exist to serve me. And so he says, I did what I often do. I issued an order, a decree, that all the wise men would come and tell me what the dream was, the meaning of the dream that I had. And it didn't matter what they had, they all dropped it and they came. And when they came, they couldn't tell me what my dream meant. And then I remembered one of them slaves that I brought. He has the wisdom of the gods in him and I call him. And Daniel comes in. Daniel's different than everybody else. And listen to me, all my young people. Daniel's different than everybody else. Daniel's not trying to fit in. Hello, somebody. I'm not saying that you ought to be the odd man out and the weirdest of the weird, but, but Daniel has principles that guide the choices that he makes, and so he's not trying to fit in. He's not trying to eat what everybody else eats and drink what everybody else drinks. He's, he's not trying to fit in. And so there's something different about Daniel, and God can use you when you decide to let God be God in your life and you to be who God created you to be. In my dream, he says, I saw a tree in the middle of the earth. It's in the center. Everything else is around it. Its height is so great that it's visible to the entire world. Its leaves are not dry and brittle, but they are green and verdant. It's a psalm kind of one kind of tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth her fruit in her season. Uh, she's bringing forth her fruit, the roots are imbibing sufficient water and nutrients. How do we know? Because its bows are loaded with fruit. It's blessing the entire world, providing shade for wild animals, shelter for the birds of the air. All the world, the scripture says, is fed from this tree. Everything is fine, Nebuchadnezzar says, while I'm dreaming this dream. But suddenly the dream changes, like an icy wind that swaps places with a balmy breeze my dream was interrupted by a message that came down from heaven. Now pay attention. I want you to see this. He, he sees this tree. It's a large tree. Its branches reach up into the heavens. But now he hears a voice coming from above him, from the heavens. And the voice says, cut it down. Lop off its branches. It's a great tree. We've learned some words over the last year because of George Floyd. We've learned of something called centering and that there are certain cultures who just assume that the world always centers around them. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. All the world centers around me. I am the king of Babylon. I, I have subjugated the Jews. I've su subjugated all the other people. I'm the center. I'm, I am the tree in the center and everybody else comes to worship and to serve me. But now there's a voice above the tree and the voice above says, cut it down and lop off its branches. And Nebuchadnezzar wakes up in a cold sweat. Nebuchadnezzar though is testifying. This is not Daniel telling the story. This is Nebuchadnezzar telling his own testimony. And if you don't mind, I just want to give you four quick things. I'm watching the clock to indicate why Nebuchadnezzar is able to give God praise for this testimony. He says, I told Daniel the dream and Daniel got nervous. He didn't even want to tell me the dream. Pastor Waddy, back in Oakwood and going into seminary, we used to have a, a joke. In fact, there were four of us and I was Daniel and Shimon was Shadrach and Makachu was Meshach, and Al was Abednego. And we used to joke about, where was Daniel when the three Hebrew boys bowed down? <laughs> you know, where was Daniel? Did, did, did Daniel bow down? Was, was he off on some mission somewhere? Where was Daniel? But you know, when, and I, I'm not preaching this as if this is Bible, but I want you to understand that God has a way of giving you an opportunity to say who you are and what you believe. And so if Daniel had missed it in Daniel chapter 3, now he shows up to have to interpret for Nebuchadnezzar a negative prophecy. 
and God had not given him a heads up that this was going to be negative. When he shows up at the palace, now he's enjoying favor with Nebuchadnezzar. He's one of his trusted advisors. But, but now when Nebuchadnezzar recounts the dream, Daniel has to then interpret the dream, and it's not a good dream. I don't know what church you've gone to lately, but sometimes I go to these churches and they've always got somebody prophesying, somebody decreeing and declaring, increase, increase, increase. But, but I want you to understand that when the prophet of the Lord came to give a word of interpretation to the most powerful king on earth, it was not a good word. It was not a positive word. Daniel had to tell him, you are the tree. That's right, you're the tree. Everybody comes around you, you're the center. And all of the world is fed by you and, and blessed by you. But understand that God has sent a message that there's someone above you. Come on, you remember that in Daniel chapter 2 when he sees the image, the image has a head of gold and chest and arms of silver and a belly and thighs of brass and legs of iron and feet of part iron and part clay and he is the head of gold. And then in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar in defiance of the dream builds on the plains of Dura 350 feet of ego. He says, I'm not satisfied to be the head. I'm going to be the whole thing because I don't want my kingdom to pass off. And even though he is in defiance of God, God sends a message to him through the dream to say, I need you to understand that I have placed you as the head of gold, but I have placed you as the head of gold and you are subject to me. That even though your branches reach up to the heavens, there is one above you who super rules and you are subject to him. Uh, he didn't come expecting to have to give him this word, but he gives him the message and then he counsels him. Nebuchadnezzar testifies, he counsels me to break off my sins. He says that I ought, to, I ought to be good to the poor and merciful to the poor. And I heard that. And year one goes by and I'm doing all right. Year two goes by, year three, four. I mean month one, two, three, four. Eleven months pass. And a year from the day when he first got the dream and its interpretation, Nebuchadnezzar walks out, Scripture says, onto the palace rooftop. I, I need you to get this because as I studied it, the, the direction is important that, that Nebuchadnezzar is not on the ground floor of the palace. And I don't know how many floors the palace had, whether it had one, two, three. I don't know how many floors it had, but he's not even on the top floor. The scriptures say that he was walking on the rooftop of the palace. It is built in such a way that the palace rooftop would give him a vista, a view, a scene of the entire kingdom that he had been used to build. And as he walks out on his rooftop and begins to look at all of what he has led people to build and to do, he looks, he's overcome with a sense of pride for the brilliance that is on display, the results of his stellar leadership. And he says, as I began to self-congratulate, is this not Babylon the great that I have built? While the words were still in my mouth, Nebuchadnezzar is telling his own testimony, before I could finish my sentence, my mind began to get cloudy. My shoulders began to stoop. It's as if the words that came from above me had a power in themselves to push me from standing straight down to all fours. There is no record that anyone else was on the rooftop with him because he's telling his own testimony. It is nowhere chronicled that any other human heard the arrogant words that Nebuchadnezzar spoke, but heaven heard Nebuchadnezzar speak and the humiliation began. Nebuchadnezzar is telling his testimony. His testimony about the goodness of God. And some of us can't give God praise when things look like this. When we find ourselves getting a pink slip, when we find ourselves with a sickness, when we find ourselves losing something, that, that we have trouble giving God praise. But Nebuchadnezzar is sharing his testimony. He says, it was God that humbled me at the point when I did not turn away from my arrogance. And the first thing I hear from his testimony is that he came to realize what I hope you and I realize, and that is that privilege 
has a purpose. What are you saying, Pastor? Privilege has a purpose. The fact that 600,000 Americans are dead but you are still alive means that your privilege, and I want you to embrace the fact that your privilege has a purpose. Nebuchadnezzar is privileged. What do you mean he's privileged? He's privileged because he's not where he is because of his intelligence. He's not where he is because he was the son of a king. He's not where he is because he went to Oakwood or CUC or Andrews or Harvard or USC or Ohio State. He's not where he is. I know, I know you think that you are where you are because you worked hard. I know, I know you think you are where you are because you're the son of or the daughter of. But I need you to understand that Nebuchadnezzar was not the king because he was so great. He was the king because God put him there. Oh, oh, let me prove it to you. Jeremiah chapter 27 and verse 6, God talking. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Did you catch it? God says, I've given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Read the end of Jeremiah and the beginning of Daniel, and you will see that it is God who turned his own people over into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. The only reason why Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold is because God chose him. God put him there. Are you hearing me this morning? He says, he is my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given to serve him. And I want you to understand that, that if you can embrace this humility to understand that your privilege has a purpose, it will relieve you of a whole lot of stress. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and let me give you another secret. That when I'm preaching, I'm preaching to myself. So you, you, if you get blessed in the process, God bless you. But, but this is the word of the Lord to me. The pressure is not on me to do anything at Ephesus. I'm the Lord's servant. He placed me here. Now, now understand, I got to be faithful. Come on, say amen. All right. But the results, they are not with me because I'm not the one who chose me. God chose me. And Nebuchadnezzar is the Lord's servant. So privilege has a purpose. God places you where he places you. I'm talking to somebody who's got a job that you did not qualify for, who's living in a neighborhood that your credit did not allow. I need you to understand that God has given you privilege for a purpose, and, and that will keep you humble because you don't choose to be where you are. You didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You did what you needed to do, but if it had not been for God's hand of blessing on you, you would not be where you are. The other night, Dr. Dell Edwards shared a devotional in one of our meetings, and it was so powerful. This little phrase, I said, can you share this with me? He's talking about humility. To be gentle or meek is to be God-molded, Christ-shaped, and Holy Spirit-directed. I love that. It's to be God-molded that when you're humble, and you do know that that's one of the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, humility, meekness, Jesus says, take your, my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am humble. I am meek and lowly of heart. And, and when we are humble, Nebuchadnezzar is testifying. I'm, I'm glad that God humbled me because uh, it helps take the pressure off of me and to realize that I am where I am because God put me where I am. Privilege has a purpose. Secondly, that God uses whomever he chooses. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I know some people think that they are where they are because of their connections. And the world operates by networking. And we join these fraternities and these sororities. And we pay to be in these club memberships and all this stuff. But I need you to understand that God can choose anybody to put them where he wants to put them. And that's what he did with Nebuchadnezzar. He chooses whomever he chooses. He uses whomever he chooses. I got to praise him because uh, God chose me. In spite of me. This is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is not a Jew. Nebuchadnezzar is not, not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God said, I can use this heathen king. And can I talk to some of y'all? Because, you know, I've grown up in this denomination. Some of us believe that ain't nothing legitimate outside of us. You don't have to say, man, I know I'm right about it. We only pray for ourselves, we only congratulate ourselves, we only invite ourselves, and there ain't nobody else legitimate. But look at God. He said, now I have chosen Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm, go ahead and go back and read it on yourself. Jeremiah 27 and verse 6, he says, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. 
And some folk are like, how in the world, God, are you going to choose a heathen king who grew up worshiping Marduk and all kinds of strange gods? And God says, that's my business. It's my job to be God, and I can choose to use whomever I want to. But Nebuchadnezzar says, let me testify that God loved me enough to deflate me, to educate me. He said, uh, he had to take me down. I got too big for my britches. My, my head got too big. I, 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 I thought too much of myself, but God loved me enough. And I want you to hear this, that God loved me enough to deflate me so that he could educate me. In verse 25, seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you, here's the word, learn. God said, I'm going to learn you. That's an old phrase that we used to use. I, until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. I almost called this sermon the arborist because an arborist is a person who takes care of a tree. They, they, they plant trees and they put the, enough space between them and they know how to take care of them and what kind of soil they'll grow. And God knows how to tend trees. And Nebuchadnezzar is his tree that he has planted in the center of the earth to be a blessing. And, and he knows how to take care of the tree, but, but he also knows how to trim the tree. <laughs> he also knows how to prune the tree. And so what he did was he said, Nebuchadnezzar, I, 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 I got I to gotta cut you back a little bit. But I love this because he said, I'm going to cut you back, but I'm not going to uproot you. Oh, come on, say amen, somebody. He, he said, I got to cut you down. I got to cut you back. I got to trim you down all the way down to the stump, but, but I'm not taking you up at the roots. I, I'll give this to you in a minute. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 3, one of my favorite scriptures says, a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. The bruised reed and the smoldering wick are talking about us. That's you and me, that, that sometimes God chooses us and we get the big head and sometimes we don't seek his face in prayer and, and say, Lord, what would you have me to do in this situation? That's us. A reed that is bruised, it might be damaged, but it is not irreparable. Come on, say amen, somebody. Smoking flax may be about to lose its fire altogether, but it can be reignited. Nebuchadnezzar says, I messed up. I was at fault. I got the big head. I got arrogant. And he took me off the rooftop of the palace and put me on the ground. He took me from being way up to help me realize that there's somebody above him. A tree service company knows that you can't just chop down the tree, but you got to remove the stump. Any good tree service company, if you paid them to come and take down your tree and they didn't remove the stump, then they're not worth their salt because some things will happen if you leave the stump in the ground. If, number one, it's a safety hazard. If you leave a stump in the ground, kids can be playing in your backyard and they won't see it and they can trip on it and skin their knee. It's a safety hazard. Did you know that a stump left in the ground can spread infections and disease? Carpenter ants and termites and other wood-boring insects will come and be attracted to tree stumps. And before you know it, that, that stuff will get into all your healthy trees. You don't leave a stump in the ground. Anybody who is an arborist knows that if you remove the tree, you got to remove it at the roots. It, it can damage your property because even though the tree is no longer above the ground, the tree roots can still grow even after the true tree has been cut down. The roots can spread. And so... Nebuchadnezzar says, I got to give God praise because he cut me down and it hurt. Now, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but if you've ever experienced the chastening of the Lord, it hurts. I I'll, just, I'll just put my hand up, but you don't have to put your hand up. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6 says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. That's right, God loved Nebuchadnezzar, the heathen king, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. The fact that God chastens us means that he loves us. And verse 11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, oh hallelujah for the later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Nebuchadnezzar has to testify. He has to testify because he's now humble and he realizes that God placed me here and God is above me. God is over me. I'm subject to him. Uh, I, I used to decree and declare that everybody would come running when I called them, but now I realize that it's my job to run when God calls me and that God uses whomever he chooses. And 
My deflation was for my education, but I'm almost done now. I want you to understand that, that, that this tree service, this arborist knew what he was doing. I told you, you don't leave stumps in the ground because when you leave stumps in the ground, they cause some problems. There's one more thing that happens when you leave in the stump, a stump in the ground. It's called a zombie tree. What are you talking about, a zombie tree? Did you know that as long as a stump is in the ground, that it can still sprout new growth? Kaylin and I were watching the other night uh, a, a, a show. Well, it was really me. I turned it on and they walked off. But I was watching something by David At Atterborough called Our Planet. And I love Our Planet. Like eight episodes of it. And it's this, you know, this man from Britain with this nice accent. But he's talking about how our planet is in trouble. And one of the things that's happening is that, you know, with global warming, the wildfires are getting worse out west. And so uh, they show this image of California wildfire and all of this charred and burned forest. I mean, these beautiful trees, some that are so old, hundreds of years old, and they're now all gone. But the brilliance of the videographer is that they set a camera up and left it in the same spot. We didn't have time to sit there and watch the time lapse, but, but they sped it up for us. And we saw from the charred remains of the, of the forest, the time lapse kept rolling. And over time, you began to see little sprouts. <laughs> and what looked like total devastation, that what looked like it was over, that other people would have waved the white flag and said, it's done. They counted him out, but, but, but the zombie tree began to sprout new life. And God knew what he was doing when he said, cut it down, but leave the stump and the roots in place. Nebuchadnezzar says, I got to finish my testimony in verse 34. He says, after this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. All I would do was look down at other people. But now when I'm down on the ground, I'm no longer on the rooftop palace. I'm down on the ground. I'm down on all forces. I'm eating grass like an oxen. I got claws like an animal. But when I look up, the Bible says that my sanity returned to me. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. When I looked up, when I stopped looking at myself and Stop looking in the mirror and stop patting myself on the back. But I looked up and saw that my help comes from the Lord. My sanity returned to me and my honor and my glory and my kingdom. But it gets even better because down in verse 36, he says, my advisors sought me out. Oh, oh, you missed it. He said, my advisors sought me out. When they, when they saw me lose my mind, everybody backed up off of me. But when I got my sanity back, when I realized that God and God alone deserves to be worshipped, that people began to seek me out. And he finally says that I was restored as the head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. What am I saying to you? That the realization that God is God led to my restoration. I serve a God who restores. I serve a God who will not count you out. He may discipline you, but he only disciplines you because he wants you to be more of who he created you to be. I have a testimony. When I look back over my life and I begin to think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. I'm not going to tell you all my testimony today, but I'm telling you, I got a testimony. And like Nebuchadnezzar, God has to humble me. But I'm so grateful that when I looked up, my sanity was restored. When I looked up, God gave me back more than I had lost. I've got a testimony. Come on, Evelyn. Will you sing something for us? Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Teach me, O oh Lord, the ways of thy statutes. 
And I shall keep them until the end. Just give me understanding and I will keep the law. I shall observe them with my whole heart. Teach me, O oh Lord, the ways of thy statutes, and I shall keep them. Until the end Just give me understanding And I will keep the law Hey, I shall observe them With my whole heart Teach me, O oh Lord, teach me, O oh Lord, teach me, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, teach me, Master. Teach me how to love. Teach me, Master. I want to know how to get down on my knees and pray. Teach me how to love every, every day. And I shall observe them. With my whole heart Teach me, O oh Lord Teach me, O oh Lord Teach me, O oh Lord O oh Lord O oh Lord oh Teach me, Master. Teach me how to love. Teach me, Master. I need to know how to get down on my knees and pray. Teach me how to walk every, every day. And I shall observe them with my whole heart. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I shall observe them with my whole heart. Ooh, I shall observe, observe them. We believe that God affords us opportunities that should not be passed up, looked over, or missed. Solomon opens the book of Proverbs with a request to his son 
and subsequent readers that wisdom would not be ignored. That as wisdom speaks, God is determined to teach something to those who listen. And we would be remiss this morning if we allowed an opportunity to pass by without extending to someone today the opportunity to receive what God is trying to teach us. Nebuchadnezzar learned an invaluable lesson that all that he had, all that he determined in his mind that he had built, uh, the root, the source of that thing was, in fact, our Lord and our Savior. Uh, and we want you all to be aware of the fact today that the same lesson is being given to each and every one of us. Look, we cannot come out of 2020, we can't come out of this pandemic without stepping back and learning what it is that God has in store for each and every one of us. So today, if you are here, and your prayer today is like that of Samuel, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I determine I will learn something. I will receive something. I will be empowered. I will be equipped. I will be enabled by God. If this is you, just stand right where you are in this space. I'm going to learn something today. There's something for me in this moment. Just stand right where you are. Nothing big, nothing more. I want to extend one more call, though. Pastor Goodman, I almost ran in the back of the sanctuary, uh, but I knew I'd distract you, so I didn't do it. But Nebuchadnezzar was cut down. But in his cutting down, he was banded. I'm not going to preach, Doc. He was banded, identified, and the root was left. There's somebody here today who feels like through their lives, situations, scenarios, and circumstances have caused them to be cut down. I need you to understand, despite your condition, there's still a root in the ground. There's still an opportunity for God to grow something new in you. There's still new purpose, new hope, new development. You still have the opportunity to place your hand in his and experience the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. If you're here and you determine this is, this is something I want to do, I want to take an extra step. I need someone to, to pray with me, to minister with me. I, 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 I perhaps want to determine today to give my life to Jesus Christ in baptism. If you're here... Put your hand on right where you are. No force, no shame. But if you determine, look, I can't leave this space without starting something new with Jesus Christ, lift your hand right where you are before we pray. God bless you. 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 Our elders, I need you to take stock of those whose hands are up in this space. Just keep your hand up one more time so they can take note of you. God bless you. God bless you. If you're watching online, our team has a number on screen. We want you to text the word Jesus to that number, and someone will get in contact with you. Someone will reach out uh, and speak with you. We don't want you to go through this moment by yourself or to miss the opportunity that God is affording you. Those of you who are standing with me, let's pray in this moment. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Father, you know that outside of you, Nothing is possible. But you have reminded us time and time again, and especially today, that in Christ, all things are possible. We have new life, new health, and strength in you today. And God, we're standing to our feet right now, uh, not because there's some magic power in our standing, but because we want to put some action behind our words. We want a, a mnemonic device lived out in our lives to remind us day in and day out uh, that we are learning something new, even now. God, you are the road signs in our lives, and we are praying for spiritual eyes to determine which ways we should go. And Lord, as you move, one songwriter says, where you lead me, I will follow. God, where you send me, I will go. Uh, the prophet Isaiah lifted his hands and said, here I am, Lord, send me. God, we determine to follow your footsteps as you lead us through life, teaching us all the way.
our Savior leads us. And Father, those of us who lifted our hands in this space, declaring that we want something more, that we want new life to spring forth from the charred remnants of our past life. We're asking that you would not leave us on our own, God, but give us a connection in you today that will be established for eternity, that we might be forever with you. And Father, as you work, as you move, we will be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. God bless you.